Ok, buenos días. ¿Cómo están todos? Bien. Thank you. That's all of the Spanish I know. So uh, I apologize, but I'll speak in English for the rest of my presentation. Uh, my name is Karim Fanous. Uh, I work for a company called Music Ally. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, a real honor to be able to speak to you today. My first time in Bogota, my first time in Colombia. Uh, and it's absolutely fantastic. So what I'm going to do over the next half hour is present to you an overview of digital trends in the global music marketplace. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at the markets and see the picture of the markets and the state of the global market. Following that, we're going to look at services, see what's happening with new access models like streaming in territories that are doing very well, like Scandinavia, for example. We'll have a look at the local market as well, and then we'll move on and we'll have a look at trends in music marketing. So I'm going to take you through a series of eight themes. Uh, the first one, let's start with, is a marketplace in recovery. So this year, the IFPI reported figures for 2012 which showed us that we had the first growth in the global music marketplace since 1999, which was amazing news. The thing is, this growth was 0.2%. So it's very, very small growth, but very encouraging nevertheless, because it was the first rise in the marketplace since 1999. Since 1999, we've had a marketplace in decline or flatline. We've never had an increase. So this is very exciting news. Uh, and The interesting news from a digital perspective is that the digital marketplace is driving the total market forward while physical sales are still in decline. So if we look at the figures, we can see that the total recorded music market was valued at US $16.5 billion. That was the 0.2% increase. The digital market was valued at $5.8 billion. That was an 8% increase from 2011. The physical market was $9.4 billion, minus 5%. So this is how we see digital is bringing us the good news. Physical decline, but digital drove the market forward. Um, and when added uh, to performance rights and synchronization rights, uh, the total market was valued at $16.5 billion. So that's a rise for the first time. Okay, so at Music Ally, we look at figures a lot. We look at data a lot. So what I want to do is show you a slightly different viewpoint. It's, it's very important to look at figures and look at them in different ways to understand the market. So let's do two things. Let's just look at physical uh, revenues and digital revenues as an indication of direct consumer demand. So consumers saying, I want to buy this product and I'm going to go get it. I'm either going to buy a CD, I'm going to buy a download, or I'm going to buy access to a music service. And then the second thing let's do is adjust the figures historically with exchange rates from the year. So in that way, we can look at kind of a real value of each year put alongside each other. If we do that, I'll show you this next graph. And what we see is in fact, with just physical and digital added together, with the adjusted uh, historical exchange rates, we actually saw a little rise in 2011. Okay, so it's interesting to see that. It's another way of looking at the figures. But what's really important, even though looking at it in this way, it looks like a small decline in 2012, what's really important is that this orange segment is increasing. That's the digital marketplace, and it's driving the market forward. So while the, uh, well, they're gray bars on my computer, but they look like blue bars here, that's the physical revenues are decreasing, and the decrease, the rate of decrease is slowing, The orange bars are growing and driving the market forward. So, that's really good news. One question we should ask is, are we at the end of the physical decline? So the decline in CD sales and other physical products around the world? Probably not. So we're not necessarily going to see steep growth in the next few years because um, you have to take every region in context. It's very important. You shouldn't just look at the marketplace from a global point of view. You should look at each territory and what's happening in that territory. So if we look at the leading territories, Japan, the second largest music market in the world, physical sales still make up 80% of that market. Digital is much lower and it's actually having a very hard time growing. So, That's Japan, the second largest market. The fourth largest market, Germany, physical sales still make up 75% of the market. Okay? And then even if we look at the US, which is the largest market, physical is 
digital is 58%, but that's still a large physical chunk. And in the UK, back home, we're looking at 39% digital and 49% physical. So physical is still a very important part of these markets. And what we'll see in a few years, we might still see a little bit more of a decline, um, either as new digital services come into the market and that's where people start putting, putting their money, or at the hands of piracy, or people just, there's a slightly less demand for physical product. So expect a few more bumps in the road uh, in the next few years, but the good news is that the marketplace is definitely in recovery and digital is driving growth forward. So let's look at cutting edge digital trends. You know, iTunes and downloads is still the real driver behind digital music sales globally, but really, really interesting things are happening with the introduction of new access models, subscription models, mainly streaming. So here we hear that Deezer has had a very good uptake. How many of you use Deezer in the audience? Okay, so that's a few more than we had yesterday. How many of you use other streaming models? Sort of like audio and other models, okay. And in those, are any of them uh, GrooveShark? Okay, interesting. Some people would say naughty, but let's talk about that later. Um, the really important thing is that I want to show you how uh, digital um, is being driven by streaming uh, in the Scandinavian markets to try and give us an idea of how the marketplace is going to grow with digital pushing it and streaming pushing that. So let's come to the next graph I'd like to show you. This is the next theme, basically access models. In Scandinavia, this graph, we need to update it. So it's until 2011. But the important thing is the picture that it paints for us. Access models as a percentage of digital revenues in the markets. So that's subscription models, mainly streaming. In Scandinavia, is rising massively, so 63.8% versus the other leading markets in the world. Oh, sorry, the uh, slides are going forward automatically. I should stop that. But um, looking at the other markets catching up, USA, Germany, UK, uh, France are really lagging behind. Japan isn't even in there because the subscription market is virtually nil. Um, and the closest one to Scandinavia as a whole, so as an average, um, is France at 23%. So Scandinavia is doing very well with streaming. Streaming is driving the market forward. But there's even more extraordinary things to be seen if we isolate the two uh, leading markets in Scandinavia in terms of streaming and digital. So let's do that. Let's look at Norway and Sweden. Okay. For the first time since 2004, in uh, 2012, Norway reported a rise in the market. Okay. So we're looking at 7% overall rise while physical was declining by 19%, so that's really impressive growth. Digital had a 61.5% market share in Norway, which is much higher than average. But the really interesting thing here to look at is subscription services, which grew 113%, which is amazing growth. Streaming, therefore, took 45% of the whole market, okay? which is a really interesting trend. So streaming is driving that market forward, as it, um, driving the digital market and then driving the whole market. I want you to take note of the download increase, 6%, okay? It's in red. So downloads are increasing while streaming is increasing. Let's remember that figure. Now let's look at Sweden, okay? Plus 13.8%, the market had been growing for a little bit more time. Really impressive growth. CD album sales declined 14.8%. The digital share was slightly higher at 63%. Streaming was 90% of the whole digital market, okay? So driven by services like Spotify, like Wimp, like Audio, and then 56.7% of the whole market in Sweden. So streaming is the, ma is, is, is the major um, segment of the market, which is a first and really important in Europe. Downloads, minus 24.7%, okay? Let's not talk about cannibalization. That's a bad word, okay? It's a very negative word, but we must look at trends, okay? And we must acknowledge that, that streaming is squeezing the space for downloads in the marketplace, and there'll be a natural transition, okay? People have been saying that downloads should grow, but for all of last year, I was saying that naturally, streaming, when it grows and takes a large portion of the market, downloads will decrease. And let's look at the figures that were reported for the first half of um, this year by the two countries. So what we see is Norway has added 10% to its growth rate, which is amazing. Physical is still declining. Digital is up to 80%. Streaming is now at 66% of total sales in the market. But that's the big one, okay? Downloads from plus 6% to minus 21%. So that's a trend, okay? 
Um, Sweden stayed overall at similar growth to the year before. The impressive figure is that streaming is 94% of the total market, okay? So that's really good news for these markets, and what it's showing us is that streaming has the potential to drive markets forward, okay? So, good news for Sweden and Norway, but we also had good news for the Netherlands, okay? And streaming is playing a part in that story too. The Netherlands reported the first growth in 12 years in the first half of this year, plus 1.9% to a value of 58.1 uh, million euros. Streaming was the major driver of that growth, more than doubling in the market from 6.8 million euros to 15.7 million euros. Okay? Physical decline by 18%. So again, streaming is driving that market forward and showing us a trend in digital, a very positive trend, and we hope one that will be replicated in other markets. But like I said, you have to take every market in its context, look at local factors, and see what's happening. So that's what we're going to do. The next theme, theme number three, that I'm going to present to you is Latin American market growth. Okay, there's good news. For the uh, second time, for the second consecutive year, Latin America was the fastest growing region in the world in terms of music sales. So give yourselves a pat on the back. That's great news. Really good, uh, really good growth. Overall music sales in the, in the region grew by 12% with a small decline in physical, minus 2%. That was offset by a sharp increase in digital sales, plus 55%. And then strong growth in performance rights, revenues, and synchronization. So what are we seeing there? A really strong bed for further growth, a really strong foundation. Physical only declined by 2%, and digital is really growing. Again, with this graph, what we've done is we've adjusted the figures with historical exchange rates. We have the leading markets, Brazil and Mexico. Brazil is the eighth largest market in the world now, great news. Um, Mexico is the 15th largest market, and then the other top five markets in Latin America, Argentina is a little bit further behind, and then Colombia and Chile at the bottom. So we're seeing growth from the top three. Um, I'll show you something interesting about Brazil in a minute. But Colombia and Chile are still slowing slightly sporadic growth. We need to see that level out and lead to uh, sharper increases, and hopefully that will come as infrastructure develops uh, in the music marketplace and new services launch and other things like the economy grow. Now, what I've just uh, shown you here, I'll stop my computer going forward, sorry about this, I have to apologize, is if we don't adjust the historical exchange rates, the Brazilian market actually grew by 8%. So we're seeing really good uh, growth in Latin America. Let's isolate digital now, okay? If we isolate digital, we see some really impressive growth. Brazil, look how it's leading the way with that strong kind of growth in the bars, up to 70 million uh, US dollars. Then we see Mexico slightly further behind, again strong growth. Argentina, smaller but consistent growth, those steps walking up the stairs to digital growth. And replicating the whole market, we're seeing Chile and Colombia, again sporadic growth. So we need that to level out and, uh, and lead to sharper increases. Important things are happening in the region in terms of digital. iTunes has launched recently. Uh, we have Vivo here, we have Deezer, we have other services like Audio as well. And um, the other streaming services will look to launch here uh, locally soon. We can be sure of that. So let's start looking at mobile trends. And let's do it in the region, okay? Because again, good news for the uh, South American region is that you have people who listen to music on their mobile phones. And it's comparable with South Korea, which is very impressive performance. So this is a percentage of internet users listening to music on their smartphones at least once a month. So look at Brazil and Mexico, 86% and 85%. That's a really good figure. It is uh, with slight caveat. It's um, referring to early adopters, but it still shows us that people want to listen to music on their mobile phones, and that's where we'll see the concentration of music consumption, okay? Which brings us to our next theme. Mobile, mobile, mobile. Mobile is quite simply where it's at in the uh, digital marketplace uh, and will be where people concentrate their efforts on in the years to come. Oh dear. Ah, okay, sorry, I know what's happened. This has got a little bit loose, so let's plug it back in. See what happens now, okay. Sorry about this. I hope you're enjoying the presentation nevertheless. I should just talk to you, really, and not use the slides. Um, okay, look, while we're talking about mobile, let's talk about something that's important for the region and important for music as a whole. Shazam. Who here knows, knows Shazam, the app? 
Okay, great. So we all use it. We know what it does. Shazam is a really big deal for the music marketplace and a really important indicator of, of, of um, mobile music. All right? Very few music apps break into mainstream culture like this. We even have a verb, okay, to Shazam something. It's when you stick your phone up and you want to find out what the track is, okay? That's how Shazam is now embedded in our everyday lives, which is really impressive from an app. With regards to user figures, it has more than 60 million monthly active users, so people who use it at least once a month, and is adding more than 2 million to that every week. 350 million total users all over the world. Uh, and it generates, this is the important thing for the music business, it generates in terms of referrals to purchase. So when you tag a track, you find out what it is, and then you go and buy it on iTunes or Amazon. It generates $300 million for the music industry per year in terms of referrals. So Shazam is a really big deal, and it's mobile only. The interesting thing for the region is that uh, this year it took $40 million in investment uh, in a partnership with America Mobile. Uh, and they have a strategy to really grow Shazam in the region. So I think Shazam is going to be a key player in the years to come, and hopefully it will help drive digital uh, sales and also streaming, because the streaming services have partnerships with Shazam. Audio, for example, um, if you want to press play from the Shazam app, it opens the audio app, if you have it on your mobile phone, and starts playing the song. So that's Shazam. Let's look at the next theme. Actually, let me just tell you something a bit more about mobile, okay, why it's so important. So Rhapsody last year told us that 40% um, of its listening is done on mobile phones. Pandora, the radio service in the US, increased its mobile revenues by 92% um, in its Q2 report this year. It said revenues had increased by 92%. And mobile listening hours make 79% of its total hours. So people are listening on their mobile phones and it's driving that message that mobile is really important for the music industry. And mobile is a key upgrade incentive for music services as well. For example, if you're using the free tier on Spotify, you want the music on your mobile, you have to pay to upgrade. So I hope I've driven that message home. Mobile is where it's at. But listen, my PC doesn't want to talk about mobile anymore. It wants to drive us forward. Theme five, Battle Royale for the access marketplace. So when we talk about the access marketplace, we're talking about streaming music models or paying to have a set number of downloads per month, for example, in e-music. But it's mainly streaming, okay? And when the big companies enter a marketplace, we know how important it is, okay? And they really are. Everyone is now fighting to take mainstream control of the streaming music marketplace because they've acknowledged that's what's driving the music market forward. So let's look at the big guns. We're talking about big guns, and it gave me a chance to put a really interesting Battle Royale video cover here. Let's talk about Apple. iTunes Radio is going to launch soon uh, in the US and globally, okay? This is a big deal, because in total, we're looking at about 20 million um, music service subscribers all over the world, okay? Spotify has around 6 million paying subscribers, and I think 26 million uh, monthly active listeners iTunes has 575 million registered accounts, okay? So that's people with credit cards linked to their iTunes account. So when someone like Apple launches a streaming service, that's what I call a potential shift moment, okay? It's a potential moment that will shift our natural behavior on a global basis, okay? Because it'll train people into streaming. It'll train them into listening to music through streaming access. For the moment, Apple will use that to drive downloads, but eventually we should see them switch an on-demand service on, like what we see with Spotify and the others. So that's a big deal, and it's coming. Google has launched its on-demand streaming service, Google Play Music All Access, quickly and quietly rolled out into 12 territories already, key territories in the world, UK, US, Europe, New Zealand, and Australia. And it will grow more. Um, and Google is part of the everyday fabric of our lives as well. We have linked uh, credit card accounts. Android OS is the biggest OS in the world. So when Google launches a music service, again, it's a big deal. Microsoft Xbox Music, with the launch of the Xbox One this year, we're going to see them compete for the living room space as a media delivery center. Okay? And music will play a big part in that. Xbox Music um, is, has a very large territorial footprint. Samsung. It launched a music service, but by its own admission, kind of bungled it, and it hasn't really grown very well. But they're relaunching the service soon, and so they'll be a big player in this landscape. Don't rule out Amazon either. Reportedly, they're um, looking at music licensing, and they have an interesting hardware, software ecosystem. So they could launch a music service as well. So that's the big guns. 
What about the standalone services that, are, that, that have launched and are becoming a part of everyday music lives? Spotify, we know about. It's just launched Spotify Connect to stream straight to devices. So that's a very interesting move. Deezer, which has a really big um, uh, adoption in, in Latin America, and I hear specifically in Colombia as well, with a link up with Tijo, the, um, the telecoms operator. Wimp in Scandinavia, and these others, Audio, which has a big territorial footprint. Pandora, Rhapsody, Simfy. So all of these services are fighting with those big guns as well. Pandora has really big um, access in America, but think about how nervous it is about iTunes radio launching. So we're going to see these guys fight for the marketplace, but that's a good thing, okay? Because competition means good service, it means good price points for consumers, and it means um, good, uh, good potential to drive the market forward. The one I haven't talked about yet is Beats Music as well. Beats Music is going to launch uh, quite soon, near the end of this year, initially in the US. It's a really big deal because of the potential to bundle with the devices. So think about when you buy your next pair of Beats headphones, if and when you do that, if you like them. You buy a high-end headphone and it ships uh, with free access to Beats Music service. Okay? That's a really uh, something with a lot of potential in the marketplace. And imagine further down the line, uh, it will embed chips on its hardware as well, its, its speakers which you put in rooms, and you'll stream Beats Music straight to that speaker. So, we have a lot of vibrancy in the marketplace and a lot of services competing. And we haven't even talked about these guys, YouTube and Vivo, okay? YouTube is arguably the largest streaming music platform in the world, all right? Ignore it at your peril. And Vivo has launched uh, in many territories. It launched uh, in Germany last week where YouTube isn't even live. That was a very big deal. Um, and it's paid more than $200 million to music rights holders without a subscription in sight, okay? So, that brings us to our next theme. We're going to have a little bit of fun here as well. YouTube memes, a new kind of content and star. We will have fun, we'll look at something fun, but this is very serious, okay? YouTube has become a new platform to launch music stars on. People like uh, Conor Maynard in the UK got signed off the back of um, being a cover artist on YouTube, and that's how he got spotted, all right? But this guy, let's talk about this guy, okay? I mean, just looking at it, it makes me smile and thinking of the video. Have we all seen Gam Gangnam Style? Yeah, we all know what it's about. So we can laugh about it, but it's a very serious thing in terms of the music business. It was the most liked uh, video in history on YouTube, the most viewed, the first to surpass one billion views, and it has generated millions of dollars in advertising, okay? So it showed us how YouTube virals are becoming part of everyday society and can really launch music artists. It broke him on a worldwide basis. He was already a star in, in South Korea, but he saw an opportunity to use YouTube creatively, did that, and is now a worldwide star. What about the Harlem Shake? Do we know what the Harlem Shake is? Okay, again, Really good fun, but fun means popular, okay, and mainstream. So what happened here was a phenomenon that we haven't really seen before. I'm not going to go on about what it was because we all know it was that crazy music track and the crazy dance and the copycat videos. But the interesting to think, thing to think about here is how it generated revenue for Bauer, okay, the guy behind the track. Instead of saying, no, I don't want people using my track, he said, okay, let's roll with this. Let's optimize the revenue generation. Let's work with a company called IND Music, which is a, a multi-channel network, an MCN we call it. It helps people optimize their revenue. And let's make as much money as we can from this. And let's think about it. At its peak, 4,000 uh, copycat videos were being uploaded a day. I'm sure some of you maybe did it. Did anyone here do a, do a Harlem Shake video? Brilliant. Uriel? Okay, great. Let's not be shy. Okay, great. At least three of us did. So you're helping Bauer make money and having a lot of fun doing it. Um, it debuted at number one at the Billboard Top 100 as well because they changed their rules to allow YouTube uh, to figure in that. So we're seeing a lot of change and a lot of influence from YouTube. Alex Zopf uh, in the audience from Next Big Sound is here. He's going to do a Q&A later, and he did a presentation yesterday. I hope you saw it. Kindly, um, well, sorry, if you don't know, Next Big Sound is a data and analytics platform. Kindly, uh, I was talking to him yesterday, and he um, printed out some screenshots for me to show you the performance of the track. So these are just relative graphs. These are video views here. So you see how quickly it kicked in early February, and there were peak views, and then it, it, you know, it, it came down here. But the important thing is to watch how this kind of view spiked, and there was amazing growth here. And this blue line refers to the number of videos detected using uh, that track 
uh, user-generated content per day. So at its peak, what Alec told me yesterday, was that nearly 20 million video views in one day, okay? Um, and uh, at that time, uh, there were 1,429 videos on YouTube, and this is just for the US, okay? So that's really interesting, and it showed us how this became a phenomenon. And you think of how much uh, revenue is being generated from advertising for Bauer. Uh, it's very, very impressive. So let's move on to the next theme. Number seven, the on-demand economy. Okay? This is really fun and exciting. Music is a very exciting place at the moment, the music industry. So what I mean by the on-demand economy, some people refer to it as the share economy. Okay? But it means that people are creating products for fans on demand. Fans are telling them what products they want, then people are creating these products in a number of different ways. But it's a whole new method of engagement and it's a whole new way of making money. So let's talk about it a little bit more. This is the person who brought it into the mainstream. We all know Amanda Palmer? Yeah, okay, some of us do. Do we all know what Kickstarter is? So it's a crowdfunding platform. What that means is she offers certain products before she's made a record, and you pledge to buy those products. And those products can be experiences as well. This is the interesting thing about the on-demand economy. We're generating new revenue streams in the music marketplace. So an experience she offered, for example, was her band would come over to your house, bring over Thai food, and drink you, over the t uh, drink you under the table, and have a great time. Imagine if you're a massive Amanda Palmer fan, you would want to pay for that. You know, another one was Paint Me Naked. She offered that, I think, as one of the things. Um, and she raised a hell of a lot of money. $1.2 million was the final amount that she raised, okay, to help her scale her album. So this brought the on-demand economy into the mainstream, okay, into our mainstream understanding, and other artists started doing it. Um, and it's now a part of the fabric of the music place. And other platforms have cropped up as well. So you don't have to use crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter or Pledge Music. Uh, band page experiences sells experiences. So you can sell an experience. Zach Wilde sold a guitar lesson for something like $2,000 and someone bought it. Another interesting development in this marketplace, uh, the on-demand economy, is a platform called Detour. I don't know if any of you are aware of it. What you might be aware of, I'll spin ahead to the next slide, is a platform called Queremos in Brazil. Do we know what that is? Okay. So what this does um, is, I'll start with Detour and explain. But basically a band says, look, I'm thinking about coming to your city. If I do that, if I commit to the gig, will you pay for it? And you as a fan says, yes, I'd love to do that. Here are my credit card details. And if enough fans say that they want uh, the band to come to the gig, Sorry, I really don't know how, what's happening with my computer here. It's misbehaving. Um, oh my gosh. Let's just press stop on this slide. So if enough fans say, I want you to come to my town, then the, uh, the band will commit to doing it. Okay, I'm not going to show the slides. Something's really going wrong here. But anyway, I'm going to talk to you about it. Uh, and Andrew Bird used it to tour Latin America. Okay, So what that does, it takes the risk out of the... Um, concept of touring or producing a tour for the musician and it also shows him where demand is and he can use that demand to um, uh, create a tour to places where he might not have gone beforehand okay I really have to apologize I think it must be the uh, not being used to Bogota my computer is streaming ahead but let's go to our last theme okay the future let's let's think a bit about what might happen first of all Let's have some fun with Confucius. As he said, study the past if you would divine, define the future. So, let's look at the past. In the past, we had music reviews via the press, and that's how we found out about bands. Now, we have trusted social recommendations via friends and curators, and music blogs online as well, curational apps, and things like that. In the past, we had a hi-fi stack in our living room. Now, we have multi-room, high-quality streaming services, and library playback, which is controlled by touchscreen apps in different rooms. In the past, we had a tape and a CD in the car. I'm still very nostalgic for my tape player. Now we have voice-activated radio and touchscreen streaming. In the past, we had concerts with light shows. Now we have gorillas appearing as holographic images, fans watching via live stream. In the past, we had Ask the DJ or the radio station what the track was. Now we have Shazam and Soundhound telling us and referring us to purchase. In the past, we had a bank manager or an investor. Now we have fan funding via Kickstarter and other platforms. Let's look at the future, okay? Coming to the last slide now. So Google Glass, right? 
wearable technology. Think about the, possi the possibilities, smartwatches. It's crazy. It's amazing to think about, okay? So, um, let's say uh, I wear a jacket to a gig with uh, smart technology in the jacket. The band triggers a show at the gig and my jacket changes color. The person next to me, their jacket changes color. This technology is out there. It's happening at the moment, okay? People are pioneering this stuff. Google Glass, right, okay, Glass, play a track on my hi-fi. Stream it straight to my hi-fi using Beats Music or Spotify Connect. Excellent. I'm walking around the house, Google Glass tracks my position, talks to the cloud, and streams in the next room. Or when I go to my car, it streams straight to my car as well, to the service in my car. It remembers where I last listened to something. Okay, so the possibilities are amazing, and people are putting a lot of time and effort into developing them. Uh, Google and... Um, I think Samsung are ramping up their smartwatch strategy at the moment, making investments and plans. So this is happening in the next 30 years are going to be very exciting. The last kind of slide I'm going to put out there in terms of possibilities, the play button, okay? Imagine whatever the device is, your watch, you say to the glass, okay, glass play, you have uh, some kind of other wearable technology, you just press play. What the play button then does, it uses your location, the time of day, your age, the season, the weather, your, last, your past listening history, analysis of emails and sentiment. If you're using the Google Play service, it might analyze, uh, analyze your emails for sentiment. It already does things like that. It correlates all of that information with other people and their listening habits, and it selects the most perfect selection for you in that place and time that day. Okay? It's a nice concept to think about. And it could really happen. This is playful, okay? I just want to open your minds. Um, I hope I have done so, but I hope I've given you some concrete uh, insight about the music industry as well. That brings us to the end of the presentation. My name is Kareem Fanous. Feel free to email me at that email address or, or hit me up on Twitter. It's been an absolute pleasure. So I'll end with that. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>